Hi, this is Dr. Carl Goldcamp. A um, few things I have to say. One is we personally are involved both as a lifestyle, a ketogenic diet, but also through my 16 years of clinical practice of what is effective. What do people need to take sometimes, all the time, to support their ketogenic diet? You'll get bits and pieces of this ongoing week after week. It's important to be comprehensive. In one way, it's simple. and one way, it's a little bit complicated. Hi, everybody. This is Dr. Carl Goldcamp, back for another edition of the Keto Naturopath. Today, I thought I'd take a slightly different turn in what we're going to do for the podcast today and basically have it be a Q&A. Now, people aren't going to be calling in, but they've, I've gotten a lot of questions. And uh, what I did was put them into similar categories. We'll do this every so often because in one way, there's always going to be a stack of common questions out there about ketogenic diet, etc. It's kind of human nature to have the same question asked again and again and again. Uh, if you're in our Facebook group, you'll most of these questions are already in the file section. You can find documents on them. Okay, so today is a Q&A. So these came in from various people. I'm not going to sort of say this came from Bobby, this came from Sue. I'm just going to the questions. I figured that's a little easier. Okay, so first is, back with the basics, is like, do I have to track macros? Is this important? Is this a forever thing? So tracking macros is obviously based on the assumption that you've calculated your macros. So, and again, this is in the reference section to our Facebook group, because perhaps this is the single most complicated with quotes around it thing you have to do. So given your height and weight, and you find a scale that can calculate your lean muscle mass, and you come up with what is your lean muscle mass? Obviously, you, your height and weight is is um, somewhat important, but mostly your lean muscle mass. So we're using your lean muscle mass once you have that calculated. I'm five ten, and my lean muscle mass is about. And I'm just don't have my numbers in front of me, but it's about 120 or 30. So the ratio I'm using is 0. 0.6 pounds per kilogram of body weight. So to get kilograms, you take your weight, you divide it by 2.2, you take that number and you times it 0.6, and that will give you the grams of protein that I should eat per day in terms of not to exceed. So use that not as, you know, an etched in stone number. For one, your muscle mass will change, we hope, if uh, you haven't worked out or your physical activity will dictate whether it gets bigger or smaller. But uh, having adequate muscle mass is a big deal in terms of overall health. We knew that for a while. And that has not much to do with ketogenic diet. It's just general truism out there. So you take that number and now you have to figure out what does that look like? So from, you know, you start with, and you have to get a, a food scale and you need to know, for instance, what is four ounces of protein that comes in ribeye steak look like? Well, you look at the package. So I'm not going to go into all that now, but that's this is how we calculate our macros, okay? So that's what we call moderate protein. So when we talk about a ketogenic diet, we say it is low carb, high fat, and moderate protein. Really, the only thing you had to calculate was the protein factor. Okay, so what about the carbs? Anybody who has listened to this certainly knows by now we're following pretty much a classic ketogenic diet or the Atkins or the modified Atkins, they're all so similar that I'm putting them all in the same kettle of fish. And I'm going to say that that's shooting for 20 grams of carbs per day. Other people, so this terminology has evolved over time, okay? So a more, I don't know if it's more contemporary, but it's it coming into use more, a 20 grams of carbohydrate per day diet is considered a very low carbohydrate as opposed to a low carbohydrate, as opposed to a moderate carbohydrate diet to a very low, low, moderate, and high carbohydrate diet. At some point, we're all going to speak the same language, but unfortunately, it's very easy to misunderstand each other. That's why I go right to the grams, 20 grams or less of carbohydrate per day. So now we have the carbs, we have the proteins, and the rest is fats. And you go, what do you mean the rest is fast? I need to calculate that out. Well, not really. You got to start where you are. First, when people, and you can listen to the series, a person who's brand new to the ketogenic diet called Brian, so we call him 
uh, keto newbie, and we're going to go for two to three months, a once a week interview of his questions, of his improvements, uh, of the issues that he's had. And uh, we have a lot of work to do in that particular case. Okay, we're looking at numbers. I'm going to do labs down the road probably after two months anyway. But these are the issues that are coming up in that as well. And so the very first lesson to me is that you need to know what, and you need to learn, what does 20 carbs, 20 grams of carbs per day look like? You know, and so for this uh, understanding, we're going to pretend all carbs are equal. In the real life, in the big world, that's not necessarily true. So if you're looking at 20 grams of carbs in a Twinkie, do they make Twinkies anymore? That it's obviously going to be a very small, that's going to be your whole day of carbs per day, whatever 20 grams is. You know, it's probably one hundredth of a Twinkie is 20 grams, I'm guessing, of course. Whereas if you had a salad, you know, you can figure out what 20 grams of carbs look like in a salad, and actually it's a good size salad. So the point there was, whatever you're looking for, whatever you're looking at in terms of, I want this to be my source of carbs, and I'm not even differentiating whether it's grains or not, I'm not even going into the different kinds of foods, I'm just saying, get to know what 20 grams of carbs is. So I would say, that you're going to, by experience, so it takes a while, to, and you have to get out your your uh, scale to measure food, your food scale, and you're going to learn this. You're going to come to the conclusion that you get a lot more bang for your buck by looking into veggies, okay? And that's the direction you should obviously head. The reason I go into this somewhat tedious breaking down 20 grams of carbs per day and not talking about the kinds of carbs is because this question comes up again and again. And I get this question from people who do not want to count carbs. They go, well, what kinds of food should I have and not have? Uh, I do answer that question. I, and I will answer that here too. But that kind of question strikes me as a person who obviously doesn't want to count things. So they're never really going to know where, they're, where they are. So they'll say, what food should I stay away from? So I answer that question this way. I say, do not have any grains. Certainly do not have any sugar. Do not have any refined carbohydrates. Those are your pancake powders. It's back to your grains. You know, you don't have your cereals. Some of the pretty obvious examples. Do not have, this is starting, do not have your potatoes. Do not have your starches. So we're taking your starches and your grains away from you. Or I'm asking you not to do those things. So this is the person, remember, who doesn't want to count their carbs. They're saying, give me a category with foods. If I was to reduce it down for that person only, I would say just eat veggies for your carbs, period. So that's a problematic question to answer. It's a simple question to answer, but it's difficult because I think that person eventually is not going to have good results. And they're going to say something like, oh, I tried the ketogenic diet and it didn't work. Or, what part didn't it work about? Well, I, if they're honest, I'll say I never measured anything. Well, there you go. So measuring is part of starting. You will not always have to measure because you will learn. You'll learn how many grams, uh, what four grams of protein looks like in a steak or in a chicken or in fish. You will think it's all tedious up front to have to do this, but you'll learn that. And after that, you'll probably never use your food scale again unless you're making something pretty esoteric and have to weigh all these things together should you want to do that. So I'm advocating please measure initially, and then you'll never have to measure. It might be a couple weeks of measuring, and then that was, that'll be the last you'll have to do with this. So that was just on calculating your macros. And I did say the rest is fat. Fat, for the most part, is said to be the controlling factor for your appetite. I think both fat and protein are both uh, affecting, at least from my experience. You know, I have the academic and the medical background, so my academic answer would be, oh yes, fats, of course, control your appetite. My personal experience is, you know, protein is a big deal too. And that's actually was more dominant in my experience in controlling appetite than fat. But both of those together. You'll find if you add fat to your protein, whatever that is, the chicken, the fish, the could be shellfish if you want to. So whatever that is, if you have a source of fat, you're going to be eating a lot less protein. So they both go together. But please measure. Two categories to measure and the other is just add fat. It'll be hard to eat too much fat, certainly initially. Okay, so we have answered, do I have to track my macros forever? I would say track your macros for the first couple of weeks, and after that, give it a break. 
if you're brand new to this, then track it in a month again, track it in two months after that, three months after that. So you're checking in on yourself because what's going to happen is that you will, if you have weight to lose, you will be losing weight. And if you're working out, you will be gaining muscle mass. So some of these macros will need to be slightly recalculated as you continue with this program. And that's a good thing. It means you're drilling down. Okay. So no, it's not a, for, uh, it is important. Yes. And no, it's not a forever thing. Okay. Biomarkers. How important are they? Again, will I have to track these forever? And how and when should I do that? So when I say biomarkers, it's a convenient term to include both taking your uh, glucometer. So you're taking your blood glucose via, and if you're not a diabetic, it's basically a glucometer, which is the same thing all diabetics use. And if you are a diabetic, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Okay. And the other thing is a ketometer, ketometer measuring ketones. We use the Keto Mojo. And why do I use the Keto Mojo? Well, I, I got to uh, meet the inventor of it. So I, I like him, but basically it's out of convenience. On one meter, I get to put in both glucose strips and ketone strips. So I just have to prick myself once and I get blood for two strips. And I like that. It keeps the numbers in a memory, which all uh, all the meters basically do. And if you like to use a lot of strips because you're drawn to collect data, they're just, they're data techie people out there and they want all the data of their life forever, then they will be inclined to use more strips. And so these are, it's a cheaper form of strips in a long time. It's kind of like shaving. You buy the shaver, but the thing that's going to drive the cost of long-term use is the razor blades. So it's the uh, strips that you'll be using. So that's, that's my ulterior motive of using Keto Mojo, but you can use whatever you want, habits or freestyle. Whatever works for you, just telling you what works for me. So now that you have that down, I like exploring. So for a brand new person, I would say pick at least two times a day. And I would say you're not going to get around to measuring your blood ketones until the second month, until after 30 days. Don't waste your time or money, and the ketone strips are more expensive, to taking your blood ketone strips uh, until after. And I'll go into why that is in just a second. And, but get comfortable with taking your blood glucose. And I would suggest if you have not started your ketogenic diet yet, then actually learn what is your blood glucose levels now. Do the three times a day if you want to. It's not required. I'm just saying it's great to have a before set of data. And this before set of data that is free for you to access about yourself is blood glucose. So prick your finger when you wake up in the morning, prick your finger noon, maybe after lunch, if you have a lunch and prick your finger before you go to bed, maybe, you know, and just play around with it. You can, over time, you're going to be asking more questions about yourself. This whole thing is an exercise in self-awareness, right? So this, taking this data is about you and how you're reacting to the world and reacting to the world for most part is going to be reacting to the food you eat in terms of macro nutrients, carbs, proteins, fats, and we'll actually be able to use on other things as well. Okay, so you take it three times a day before you started and you have perhaps even a spreadsheet. Write it down someplace because you're going to see these numbers probably change. They'll probably decrease for the average person unless you're pretty exceptionally healthy already. Okay, so now you have that. Now you're starting a ketogenic diet. And so we've already been through the calculating the macros and you're finding out what you're going to have. And let's say you're starting day one if you figured out your 20 carbs per day. Okay, so now you're doing your 20 carbs a day, and what's going to happen? Well, your glucose is going to come down because you're you're not giving it a source of glucose fuel. You're starving yourself, in essence. You're on a technical, you're a carb fast, if you want to look at it that way. And that's not a bad way to look at it because a low carb, or even a no carb, but a low carb diet, in this case, as I said, a very low carb diet, this is imitating being on a fast. Your body is interpreting this low carbs are, wait a minute no carbs are coming in. We are, it's a stressor. It's a positive stressor. And it's saying, we must be fasting. What happened to all the food out there? We must be you know, doing a fast. We must be starving. Well, you're obviously getting enough protein, you're getting enough fat. So it's feeding the things that for the most part are going to be able to make ketones. So they're going to be derived from fat. Protein can eventually, if you have too much protein, can actually be converted into glucose through a process called gluconeogenesis. So if you have too much protein, you'll that's a sure source of sugar, of glucose. That's why we monitor our protein. Okay, then. So you have those things down, and now you're measuring your glucose, and you go, gosh, I got a little change. 
Well, the other thing you might want to measure, you don't have to, but people like to do this, is they get uh, the ketone strips, these urine strips. They are very cheap, and you're only going to be using them in the first month. And after that, uh, there really isn't much use to use them at all, in my opinion. And the reason is, as you stepwise go into ketosis and nutritional ketosis, is that you will start to make ketones. And as you start to make ketones, something you probably haven't created in nearly all your life, except for back when you were born, and uh, perhaps even born and breastfeeding if you were breastfed, is that now your body has to adapt to burning on ketones. You're waking up, you're making this change, this alternative fuel that does all these wonderful things you've heard about. So in this change, and primarily it's gonna come across, the biggest change is gonna be in the first three days of your body waking up and making these changes. Um, is the ketones are going to come into your blood, of course. Ketones are made in your liver, come into the bloodstream. A lot of them will be actually filtered out and spilled, is the word, into your urine. And you'll be able to measure it in your urine. Well, that sort of lack of filtering, so we just, we ended up, we just woke up the body and the body is now starting to make this new thing, which is pretty much is never made for however many years you are old. And now we're starting to make it. The liver, uh, the kidneys have to wake up too and filter out this thing saying, oh, we're supposed to keep ketones. And these are ketone bodies. And that means uh, the fancy words are beta hydroxybutyrate and acetoacetate. And then there's acetone, but that goes out of your breath. doesn't get to the kidneys. So it takes about a month for your kidneys to learn about ketones and to say, ketones, you're not going anywhere. You're staying in the blood. So because they stay in the blood, in the course of the month of this, right, of your kidneys adapting to this, you're going to find that your your blood urine strip is first going to say, hey, you're creating ketones because we find it in urine, but eventually your kidneys are going to shut that off, uh, shut the ketones from getting into your urine, and you're not going to measure it. So your ketone strips are going to be worthless. They're going to say, they're going to show you that you're not spilling, leaking, if you will, any ketones, which is a good thing. So that's why you don't need a lot of ketone strips ketone urine strips. Okay, the other thing that happens, and it's probably worth mentioning it now, in this first month of you transitioning from using a urine ketone strip to ideally a blood ketone strip and a ketometer, which you can use in the Keto Mojo, is your uric acid is going to go up. So why would you care about your uric acid? Most of you will not care, nor not even know this is happening. But if you are a person who has gout, and then if you have an elevated concentration of uric acid in your blood, that's going to be temporarily perhaps even a painful transition. The good news is that that will come back to normal in four weeks, six weeks, sometimes three weeks. But it's a rise and fall. Certainly the first week or two are the more acute in terms of that so you notice I said concentration. Your production of uric acid does not go up, nor does it go down. And the reason the concentration goes up is because this is the belief, is that as you're leaking these ketones that I just told you about, they are taking the spot of the uric acid. The reference is they're competing to be filtered out. So as they're being filtered out, that's keeping the uric acid from being filtered out. So therefore the concentration is increasing. In the course of the month, ketones don't get filtered out, the uric acid goes back to being filtered out by the kidneys and is spilled, in, not spilled, but is sent away into your urine, okay? So that's the month of transition. So when people start their ketogenic diet, not only are their first three days of them adapting, and that's what they'll talk about, and people talk about keto flu and all these other things, but it's really the first month, in my word, that's where I like to follow people that I know and to walk them through the first month because uh, they'll get a few easy rewards. They'll lose fat quickly in that first month, and then that will slow down. But they're going through a number of changes. But once they're through that first month, it's pretty much not much else is going to change that quickly, that dramatically. They're on a, a set path. Okay, so that was about biomarkers. Do you need to take them forever? No, I would just take them intermittently. And uh, are more ketones better than fewer ketones? Um, not necessarily. The range, the reference is called nutritional ketosis. So that's a term that's been offered. It's to show you there's these sections 
of the volume of ketones, the concentration of ketones in your blood. So basically, people look at nutritional, your optimal range. I don't know if it's optimal or not. I'm just giving you the definition of nutritional ketosis is 1.5 to 3. They say that's the optimal, and that's milligrams per liter. So you look at those numbers, and anything, for the first month, there is no judgment about your numbers. There's never any judgment about your numbers, but you're going to see your numbers are eventually going to go up. And to give you a reference range of, is this important or not? To me, I think this is important. Others say, hey, it's not that important. You just got to like get your body going. And so there was this big study done by Verta Health, which is out of the University of Indiana. That's connected with Jeff Volek and Dr. Uh, Dr. Volek and Dr. Steve Finney. One's a PhD and the other's an MD. Interesting combination. So they finished this long, year-long study of type 2 diabetics because that's their goal to help type 2 diabetes, to reverse type 2 diabetics. So their summary was that, yes, they got, I think it was 90-some-odd people, 90-some-odd percent of all the people in their trial into ketosis, but barely into ketosis. I think they were... I've read it a couple of times. I don't know how the numbers exactly in front of me, but it was like, maybe they got up to one. But by the end of the year, they were at 0.5. So they barely got in and they barely stayed in ketosis. And, but they, when you look at fat loss and you look at some of the parameters and their drop of glucose, all that was a good movement. Would that have been better if they were a point higher? Who knows? You know, it's, that study has yet to be done. So when people talk to you in terms of black and white facts, this is the number you need to be in. We don't know that. That's why these large population studies are very helpful to give us sort of at least a reference. And everybody is themselves. You know, when we get to talking to your cholesterol and your other other labs, it's about you. And we have a reference, but I, I, you don't have to buy. It's not etched in stone is what I'm saying, like everything else. It's just a reference. And uh, I run a lot higher in terms of ketones. My ketones are pretty much from three and sometimes they get up close to seven. Is that good? I don't know. You know, there's just too few people. I don't know that many people that run those ketones or share the information on running ketones at that level for a very long period of time. So I go with, I like the fact that I don't dip it. it this is pretty much ho-hum, you know, every day for me. It's not a major effort on my part. I like that. Um, I'm 61, so I know that ketones are great for keeping my brain younger and feeding an alternative fuel. All, there's plenty of studies on that, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, ALS, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I, uh, neuroprotective, I like that. So is it bad to be at seven? I don't think it's bad. It's, you know, ketoacidosis is way down at 25. Part of it is developing you taking your own biomarkers. And I try to encourage everybody to keep a spreadsheet. Uh, Hopefully most people work on computers now and they can open up, you know, numbers or Excel and just start their little spreadsheet and keep their numbers because I think for them seeing their own changes, remember this is all about creating an awareness of what your biomarkers are and how they change. And the nice thing about this in the future, say month number two, month number three, six months, a year, two years, you're going to be asking slightly different questions because you're going to know your norms now. And you're going to say, gosh, I just um, had an argument with my boss or my girlfriend or my wife or my husband, or I had some financial stressor. And if you take your blood glucose and ketones after that, you're going to see, isn't that interesting how stress affects your biomarkers? Another one is, another very common question is, you know, I just came back from working out and I found that my glucose went up by 20 points. Well, uh, working out is a stressor and stress produces cortisol. Cortisol forces your liver to produce sugar, uh, glucose. And um, so that's how that goes. So when you have stress, whether it's self-induced or emotional or whatnot, your blood sugar is going to go up. Another time that your blood sugar is going to go up is when you wake up in the morning. They call that the dawn effect. And primarily that's because a number of hormones, this is now getting into what they call chronobiology. There is a, a diurnal cycle of certain hormones rising and falling. So if you pick any particular uh, hormone, sex hormone, thyroid hormone, uh, stress hormones, your cortisol or antidiuretic hormone, choose one and you'll find it has its own norm throughout the course of the day. So around 5 a.m. to 7 a.m., 
you'll find for everyone, male or female, that their testosterone increases. And so does their cortisol. It's the, you're waking up. So when you're sleeping on a regular basis, you didn't just arrive and have, you know, huge jet lag, but you've been there for a couple months, that you'll find that uh, your cortisol goes up in the morning, therefore your blood sugar is going to go up in the morning, and then it's going to fall. So when you're into measuring ketones, your ketones are going to be lowest in the morning, and they're going to be highest in the late afternoon. So once you know all these things, you're going to be exploring your life and your reactions in terms of blood sugar and the ketones to both environmental, you know, if let's say you're way out hiking and you happen to bring a ketometer or a glucometer just to sort of see what a whole days of hike would look like, wouldn't that be interesting? So once you get to know this, I'm, I'm very encouraging you to be a little on the geeky side to keep track of your biomarkers. So do it intensely for a week and then forget about it. And then a month later, do it maybe for a couple days, and then forget about it. And so that's how you'll use this. This will be a tool you'll come back to to give you a peek into your own biomarkers. And I think that's very helpful. You know, I, I absolutely do. So here's another way you can use it. And it's a little bit of a tangent, but not much. So I didn't cover much about the different kinds of foods to eat other than I said, take away the grains and take away the starches, right? So then you're saying, okay, well, then that means I have meat, fish, chicken, you know, shellfish and, and cheese and dairy correct, right? Well, funny you brought up dairy because dairy is a is, can be problematic for a lot of people. What does problematic mean? Well, it could be a source of inflammation. So back when I practiced, uh, the easiest thing for the most number of patients to do, you know, this is by measuring in blood work and measuring their stories of their situations. If I told everybody for two months, please do not have any dairy. That means no yogurt, no cheese, no milk, no ice cream. And of all the th foods that you're eating, read the labels, make sure there's no dairy ingredients there. So that takes a little bit of a work before you start your two months of no dairy. And then I'll say, uh, don't have any wheat. So now it's not just gluten, gluten. So you look for no wheat. The average patient that came in almost regardless of their issues. Certainly it would be mandated. If there are cancer patients, it's mandated that you're not doing dairy and you're not doing wheat. And I don't know when, if we'll ever get back to it. So if you did that for the average patient that came in and then you asked them to take some fish oil and because it's obviously a good source of omega-3 and a few other things, that was remarkably effective for, I'd say, 90% of my patients. As much as they loved having a more specific, detailed therapeutic plan of taking other supplements and we'd look at their blood work, this was the primary, the biggest changes, the biggest bang for the buck were these three things. So back to dairy. You know, uh, for those people who really work out, you know, they're into whey supplements, you know, uh, concentrated protein, post-workout powders and so on. Well, whey, part of dairy, actually increases your insulin. So if you increase your insulin, it's going to force your, uh, and it rises for a number of things, but we know it rises mostly for blood glucose it rises and it forces blood glucose in your blood to be stored into fat cells. So it independently, so whey is known independently to increase your insulin. And there are other studies that are saying dairy in general will increase your insulin. They are less clear on that. Is it because how dairy is processed, the pasteurization and all the other stuff that's put in? At this point, it is not able to differentiate between, let's say, a population that just had healthy raw milk and a population and, and in all its derivatives of that came from raw milk, and cheeses and raw yogurt and so on and so forth, and pasteurized, pasteurized milk and the fact if it came from cows with growth hormones and estrogens and so on. So they get passed down into your milk as well. So dairy is a lot bigger issue. And then there's uh, the issue of what we call A1 and A2, casein and different cows. We're going to cover dairy as a whole separate topic down the road. What I'm simply saying right now is that dairy, as a food group, as much as people love cheese, I love cheese, but it is always a problem for me and for a lot of other people. And the very least, it makes me very phlegmy. At worst, I'll have stomach, not quite stomach cramps, but stomach discomfort. And, but the bigger issue behind that symptomology, my particular problems, and other people's very similar problems, is that it will raise your insulin. 
Okay, so that's about dairy. Take it or leave it. I would say if you're just starting off, leave it on. Don't make your beginning so difficult. But down the road, when you get to have a little confidence and expertise in taking your own ketones and glucose, you may want to go without dairy and then have some dairy and see what happens to your glucose and your ketones as an independent factor, and you'll be surprised. So that's the kind of awareness you can get by your biomarkers. They're more than just, hey, I track my sugar, I track my ketone. Down the road, they can help you differentiate what's reacting in your body. So I, I love that. I love the fact that uh, we're encouraging people, I was about to say patients, to take care of themselves. This was not uh, easily available even 20 years ago. People could get their ketometers, but this sort of information about ketones and glucose and having people do it on a daily basis uh, is a wonderful open door, free in essence, to tracking and getting very valuable information. The other is obviously getting blood work done, and we'll talk about that down the road. Okay, so a few more questions here. The next question is, are there supplements that I need to take when I go on the ketogenic diet? In short, I'd say no, and then I'm going to qualify that. And perhaps that's rather odd that I'm saying that because this is coming from a naturopathic doctor who probably, when you look back at the practice, should you want to know that in any naturopathic practice, at least 25% to a third of their practice revenue is generated from the sales of supplements. It used to be that naturopathic doctors had sort of exclusive rights to various supplements and brand names. There was a doctor's office kind of thing. Right now, all those brands you can buy on Amazon for the most part. And they may put a different name on it, but they sell to the public under one name and they sell to doctors under another name. And anyways, that's how that goes. So you bet that not just for revenue, but for patient care application, it was a big deal. So the necessity of, and the use, the necessity and the use of supplements for one's health really can be called uh, orthomolecular medicine. That is, you are assessing the patient for various deficiencies. And there's various ways you can do that. SpectraCell is one company we use. There's others that are out there. And basically gives you a nice report of what are the deficiencies of a particular person. You look for the most egregious deficiencies and you make sure in the very least you take a really good supplement that can be bioavailable for those. The other reason we would use supplements, we would do a lot of genetic testing and the genetic testing would show certain predispositions that uh, certain patients had a difficult time converting certain nutrients into usable nutrients in their body. One would be um, what they call a, um, a SNP, singular nuclear polymorphism. That's a genetic mutation. I happen to have it. And a lot of other people happen to have it. It happens to be associated with autism, among others. Anyway, these people have a difficult time making an active form of folic acid. So they could have, they either have to get a special form of folic acid or they have to very much increase the amount of folic acid that they are having. Because these are the people that are predisposed to uh, spina bifida, um, hair lips, to uh, variants, you know, schizophrenia. It goes on and on. And it's one of the associated polymorphisms, mutations, that seems to be pretty popular in the autism population. Having said that, there's a lot of things that are in the autism population, so I'm not trying to get into that. But I'm saying we took that, and that would be one of the things on a per-patient basis we would make sure that we would give supplements for, okay? So moving away from that rather technical perspective, the supplements that I would suggest that uh, people take on the ketogenic diet are magnesium and salt. And so the source of salt would be, you know, we use Himalayan salt. It doesn't have to be that. I would use sea salt, Irish sea salt. I just wouldn't use straight sodium chloride. And you, I put that in my coffee and I put it in my tea. Oddly, I'm not a salt person on my food, so I don't put it on my food. But it wouldn't be bad if I did. So there's salt. Why salt? Because it's a general mineral source. That's why we're doing that. Specifically, electrolytes that are lost more easily in a ketogenic diet, sodium and potassium and magnesium. So magnesium would be the other supplement. And why would I do that? Now, one is, I just said it's an electrolyte that you can lose pretty easily. But one of the complaints, common complaints of people starting a ketogenic diet is that they'll get cramps. They'll get muscle spasms, muscle cramps in your legs, your calves, 
your neck, your back, your arms. I get them sometimes in my uh, abdominal muscles. And so this is not something you really have to worry about other than it's being physically uncomfortable. They will pass. All these spasms will pass. But in part, the reason you're having this increased muscle spasms, Charlie horses, is because you are deficient in magnesium. And that deficiency is, for the most part, is transitory as you're getting into ketogenic diet. But anyway, take a magnesium supplement. What kind of supplement would I suggest? It would be magnesium, malate, glycinate. That's what I use, malate or glycinate. Does it have to be that? No, it doesn't have to be that. Some people use magnesium three and eight. It's up to you, but this is what I use. It's fairly cheap. I just would not use magnesium oxide and I would not use magnesium sulfate, that's Epsom salts. That's not bad. It's just not effective for what you want to do. You want this magnesium to get out of your gut, get into your blood, and get into to be more bioavailable for both muscles and your red blood cells and so on. Okay? So that you'll find that that's important. You'll discover one way or the other. You'll either start getting your Charlie horses and then have to go back and remember that I told you this, but that's that's good. We all learn that way, right? So part is just information and part is our own experience. The other question that tends to come up fairly quickly, well, I would say quickly, it's it's uh, in a population of people that are hypothyroid. They have a low thyroid. And these people are probably on thyroid hormone. And so the question for them is, will this diet affect my thyroid hormone? And to them, they kind of hold their thyro- thyroid hormone pretty dear to them because first of all, they've been diagnosed and now they're being treated on any number of various th- thyroid hormones. And they probably, prior to being diagnosed, were either overweight, they were tired, they might have been depressed, and um, there's a lot of hypothyroidism going going around. The autoimmune version of that is called Hashimoto's thyroiditis, and there's also a hyperthyroid, but we're talking about hypothyroid. So when people go on the ketogenic diet, yes, their thyroid hormone actually does is known to decrease in most people. How's that? Or in many people. There are not huge studies to say this is across the board, but it's not unusual for this to happen. So is that dangerous? That's the part nobody knows. See, the problem is it's been pretty well documented by a number of studies that thyroid hormone, your thyroid stimulating hormone decreases. However, nobody has reported symptoms, complaints of hypothyroidism. Nobody's complaining they're tired. Nobody's complaining they had weight gain. So all the symptomology, all the complaints that are associated with hypothyroid never showed up, but yet their TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, has decreased. So part of the thinking is this, that actually the ketogenic diet makes your thyroid hormone more sensitive, or you more sensitive to secreting your thyroid hormone. Just like we talk about insulin, that part of the ketogenic diet is sensitizing, making it a better hormone. It's more acutely triggered for the exact amount that's needed on a per moment basis. So that's the result on that. Having said that, back in the days of uh, the Atkins diet, Dr. Atkins, that he actually did prescribe thyroid hormone, TSH, to many of his patients that he saw, documented, that had a low thyroid hormone. How'd they do? I don't know. Um, What I'm arguing about, nobody knows if it's absolutely necessary. It has been documented that thyroid hormone is low. And there you go on that. So play it by ear. I would say if you're hypothyroid and you're on thyroid hormone, then you're going to work with your endocrinologist and saying, this is what I'm doing. Let's monitor this and tell them how you're feeling. Don't let it just be a lab driven answer only. Oh, my thyroid hormones come down. I need to have, you know, more thyroid. Why don't you wait and just see how you feel? But I would say being monitored is the easy answer here. And it's the logical and the smart thing to do is to bring your doctor into this. Hopefully, he'll have a good attitude about what you're doing. Okay, weight loss. We're going to go into thyroid hormone as a future topic a little more in depth later on, but it's these are, it's Q&A today. So weight loss, people, for the most part, do come to a ketogenic diet for weight loss. So unless you have a neuro- neurological predisposed, either family history or currently experiencing and have been diagnosed with a number of neurological conditions or cancer, then for the most part, it's people come in to ketogenic diet for weight loss. So what happens in weight loss? Why is this a good thing? Can it be a good thing? Is it a good thing? Initially, everybody loses weight a little bit, and that's simply because you've stopped having carbs. 
and it's what we call water weight. So the word carbohydrate, got the hydrate part. Hydrate is water. Carbo is simply carbon. So this is your water-attached carbon food source. So once you stop, if you will, eating carbon water, carbohydrates, you will find you need more water. That's why I mentioned drinking before, drinking water. And so you're losing your water weight. Your, your body is now sending out more water and you're bringing in less water via carbohydrates. So that's where your initial weight loss comes from for the most part. Then it's going to level out. And for long term, if you have a lot of weight to lose and you have a high percent weight, like um, on the weekly series we do with Brian, the keto newbie, that he's starting at a, a fat percent of over 30% and a BMI of over 30. So technically that's a definition of obesity. So we're going to watch those numbers change He's in, in, for an example, he's lost a good 12 pounds. I think he's at 14 pounds now. Over really, for the most part, most of that happened in his first week or two. Here on out, now that he's not quite a month into it, it will be appetite driven. In other words, there is no secret or special formula or unique hormonal interaction or hack. I hate that expression, by the way, hack or hack. Uh, to the ketogenic diet for losing weight. The only reason you're losing weight is you have less appetite. And you have less appetite because you're eating more fat and moderate protein. So your appetite drops down. And all of us in our former pre-ketogenic diet days had certain food triggers, whether that was a beer, in my case, or sugary milk chocolates, in your case, or candies, or all these other triggers that these triggers, these carb triggers, and beer has plenty of carbs, will decline. They will be less hot button issues. And so as time drifts away from that, you're resetting this whole metabolic health and you're, that's what you're in essence doing. You're uh, increasing your metabolic health. You'll find you have less and less cravings for that. So those triggers won't have you going back to get that beer or the chocolate or the Snickers bar or whatever the thing is that you used to love. So that will disappear with time. But basically the big formula is your appetite drops, you eat less, you lose weight, and that's the secret of the ketogenic diet. Some people say, well, can I eat too much fat? That's actually a a smarter question than it, it sounds like, is that most people initially feel they have to eat a lot of fat. I would say that's a good thing to feel because it's a weird, you know, once you're realizing eating more fat. Gosh, you've never done that before. Where do you get your fat? Those are the questions that come out of that. But after that, after you realize you've been doing your biomarkers, you can probably back down on the fat. And there's a number of uh, topics we're going to have both on kinds of fats that you'll have and how much fat you need to have and how that changes. But uh, one of the things I do use is C8 triglyceride. Uh, We have a product. So C8 keto MCT oil. Why do I do that? because that actually was researched out in the 70s, what they call an MCT is a saturated fat, MCT oil diet. It means that I or anybody else doing something similar to this can consume less fat because it is more efficient at creating ketones. So I've cut my calorie amount of fat down by making that fat more efficient. And to my knowledge, there is no more efficient fat. It's a saturated fat caprylic acid or C8 triglyceride. So there you go. I would say this isn't so much a plug. This is a plug for my belief in caprylic acid triglyceride as being a vital part of my method of my way of doing a ketogenic diet. It doesn't have to be your way of doing it. It just allows me to add fat to on my salads or on my meat or on my fish or whatever it is. It's tasteless and I, I would advocate it even makes things taste better. It's a convenient way to add in my fat without having to go contrive it. We even make a I mean, getting scoops of butter or coconut oil or whatever. Uh, we do make a, a mayo out of it for ourselves two or three times a week because that's another healthy way of having fat. So we put C8 with avocado oil and we blend up our mayo. So those are our secrets. But for the most part, you know, you will be having a lower appetite. You'll be consuming fewer calories. You'll be losing weight. That's the bottom line of how weight loss works. So it is a long-term thing. And I see the ketogenic diet as, yes, being a lifetime diet, not a religious diet. And it doesn't mean I'll always be in ketosis. I will probably go to somebody's wedding or somebody's party. And you know, for one, the foods won't be there that I would eat normally. And I'll just you know do what other people do. And it will pull me out of ketosis. And then I'll come back into ketosis when I go home. So I'm not too worried about it. It's not do or die. 
But if I have control over my foods, for the most part, I make sure I stay in ketosis. Then I also make my exceptions. I do like my shot of Irish whiskey every so often, but that's a whole nother topic. We'll get to that one later on alcohol. Okay, what are some common lab changes that we can expect? I'm just hitting this topic, and I think labs in general are a great thing to talk about. But for most part, certainly in my case, my wife's case, and everybody that I know, your total cholesterol will go up. Does it go up in everybody? I have heard it does not go up in everybody. However, the people that I know that I have followed, it went up. So I was in low 200s, so I'm now up around 300. Does that matter? Well, the answer probably is going to be no. Since 2008 at Johns Hopkins, it's kind of the shot heard around the world in terms of looking into cholesterol, that cholesterol is not just one thing. Cholesterol is made up of particles, and you have small concentrated particles, and you have big fluffy particles. This is all cholesterol. So consequently now, it's very common for people not only to get their lipid panel, which will give you your total cholesterol and your HDL and your triglyceride, but you'll do something called an NMR. That will give you your particle sizes. So what's happening in this My300 number, for instance, is that most of this is big fluffy particles that are not dangerous at all, and only few. So you want very few small, concentrated, and a lot of low-density, fluffy cholesterol particles. And so that's what's going to happen. You're going to have a shift in the percentage of particles of concentrated versus low-density or fluffy. The more conspicuous things that will change for you is your HDL will go up and your triglycerides will go down. So my HDL now is consistently over 100 and let me go back. This is from my perspective of that lab, which is consistently over 100 for the last couple of labs, is that I think that's pretty remarkable because after 16 years of seeing patients and, and we were not getting into the ketogenic diet by the time we, I was uh, leaving our full-time practice, and the number of patients that had OK HDL for their lipid panel was very low. And the number of patients, there's only one that I can remember that ever had anything over 100 and she consistently had over 100, and I should have looked back in my, my mind and saying, so what's your diet all about? But you want the combination of high HDL, she could have been genetically predisposed, which I think is what I wrote that off as at the time, but you want a low, uh, pretty much a, a two to one ratio of your HDL, of your triglycerides over your HDL. And uh, my ratio is really like, almost a one-to-one. -one. So that's good. So your ratio, to answer that question, you want your triglycerides will fall down to what they say a good number is 70. Many people have come in, and certainly I have former patients calling now and uh, thinking about the ketogenic diet, and their tri triglycerides are two or three or 400. So they have a long way to go. But the good news is, once you stop having those carbs, your triglycerides are going to drop like a stone. It, it's it's almost like you're pulling a string. It's that closely correlated. And you're going to see your HDL is going to go up. So those are the changes you're going to see. Your inflammatory markers, your CRP, or what they call high sense HS CRP, they're all the same thing. That's going to drop. And uh, I don't know where it is right now, but eventually you're going to end up under one, which is very low or almost non-existent inflammation. And that's pretty much the, the final goalpost. You want a low inflammation. So those are the things you can look forward to. And the last thing I'll close on this is when people ask about saturated fats, back to me talking about caprylic acid triglyceride or even MCT oils in general, is that those are saturated fats. And I won't go into what a saturated fat is, but basically it's a, it's a long, it's a very simple fat. That the saturated fats were vilified in the late 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and even into the 90s, and even now currently saying, oh, wait a minute, um, saturated fats are bad for me. Well, guess what? I've been doing my C8 for at least a couple of years, and um, I my saturated fats are fine in terms of my labs. They're, and that's kind of a more advanced level of looking at labs, and I say we'll get into that. So the single, if I wanted to have in my labs high saturated fat as a reading, I would have to have more carbs. So when you drop your carbs, you drop your saturated fat lab result. So 
the idea that eating, consuming saturated fat, C10, C8, arguably C12, if you consume these in your foods or they're part of the the kind of food that's in your, you know, the ingredients and so on, if you consume these, they are not going to affect your blood lab work for your saturated fat. But if you have high carbs, you will see elevated saturated fat. So as much as it seems counterintuitive that if you eat saturated fat, you don't get high saturated fat, it's because you're burning it. Saturated fat is, is, is your preferred fuel. That's the thing that goes quickly to the liver and gets converted into ketones. C8 is very fast. C10 takes a couple hours and C12, you know, has to go around the neighborhood before it shows up in your liver. We'll get into that later. All right. I want to start there. I thought that I want to stop there. I think that's a good list of question and answers for a general orientation. And we can go on from there. Feel free to join our Facebook group, which is Keto Naturopath. Uh, join there, ask questions. It's small. It's closed. It's non-advertised. And we're gradually trying to build this out and be comprehensive in terms of our approach. Our approach, by the way, is not just labs, as people have been listening, it's a lot about the history because I think if you have the context of where these things came from, the concept of the ketogenic diet, you won't be surprised. It's been around for hundreds of years, arguably millions of years. So when people say it's it's a new trendy diet, um, you can say it absolutely is a trendy diet. It's not a new trendy diet. It's a diet that's been around about 2 million years and it's still trendy. I think that's something. Okay, till next time, and I hope you enjoyed today. Thanks for listening. For anybody who has any questions, feel free to contact me on our Facebook group, Keto Naturopath. Same name as our podcast. I'm open to any questions and we plod through the good and the bad, the difficult and the easy week after week.